PYE, PE 177, 1954. Vintage radios and the like have lethal voltage, so only personnel with the proper training should make or attempt such repairs. If you elect to follow any of the practices and procedures described here, you are doing so at your own risk and under your full responsibility. If you do not know what you are doing, do not attempt any of the following practices and procedures. This radio was found in Italy, donated by a friend who inherited it from his father. This model was manufactured in England and this radio set must have been sold in Tanganyika, from a shop that had two addresses, one in Mashi and the other one in Ryusha. This radio model mounts rimlock socket vacuum tubes, which have been used mostly in Europe during the early 50s. Like other similar PYE radio chassis, also this model has a fairly complicated system of dial cords. Under the chassis everything seems to be intact. All the soldering points are marked with the red color and none of them seems to have been altered. The power transformer, as well as the output transformer, are sealed with tar, which stained everything inside the chassis. Unfortunately, also the coil cores have been blocked with tar, which might make further alignments difficult or impossible. Many resistors seem to have suffered from excessive heat. Most of the film capacitors are externally broken. Before going any further, after resolving a minor issue with the power switch, the radio is tested, but with no success. Considering the condition of the chassis, the extension of the damaged components and the way that the components have been mounted on different layers under the chassis, it seems wise to just dismantle and rebuild the radio completely. However, there are no reliable schematics for this model, only the schematics of similar ones. At the New Zealand Vintage Radio site, the model PZ69 is chosen as a reference. The radio is slowly dismantled then, comparing everything with the schematics available and writing down the actual component disposition. The schematics of the model PZ69 is modified accordingly, with the exception of the tone module and of the tuning module. They are slightly different from those in the PZ69, but the reverse engineering seems to be impossible, due to the complexity of the rotary switches used. In the modified schematic, the areas delimited with the green dotted line, are part of the mentioned modules. To give more meaning to the schematics, a simplified version is written including only PU and broadcast band, with the first tone selection. In this version, also the component values are visible. All the components are removed from the chassis. The connections of the band selection module, as well as those of the tone module, are carefully labeled. The tube sockets and any other part is separated from the bare chassis iron. The chassis is clean from rust, paint residues and tar, soaking in vinegar for 24 hours. It is then cleaned with iron wool and washed in the dishwasher. Immediately after the treatment it is painted with zinc paint. Then, the rebuilding process can begin. The rebuilding process takes into account the different form factors of the new components. For example, the capacitor C31 is now part of the tone selection module, and the electrolytic capacitors are distributed in a more convenient location. Also a couple of fuses are added. Here is the final component arrangement under the chassis. 
At this stage, the radio is tested, but only one or two very faint stations could be received. Initially the wrong hypothesis are made. The first three tubes are replaced with new ones, obtaining only a slight improvement. The intermediate frequency transformers are checked, finding that there was something not perfectly soldered, but still without resolving the problem. Out of despair, the band selection switch module is washed in the dishwasher, but still without achieving the expected result. While remounting the band selection switch module, the connection to the pickup is omitted, showing another slight improvement in the reception. Later, this connection will remain open, to keep this improvement, considering that that input port will never be used. Finally, the culprit is found, the connection marked on the schematic with the dotted line was missing. In this radio, tar has been used by the factory, to lock the cores in the coils. It has been possible to move only the intermediate frequency transformer coils, to tune them to 470 kHz, heating them up with a hot air gun. But the same technique cannot be applied to the oscillator and antenna coils, because the plastic would melt, as the picture shows. This makes it impossible to align properly the dial scale and the tracking between oscillator and antenna section. Anyhow, the radio can now work sufficiently well. This radio model includes a magic eye, which was originally not separable from the chassis. Considering that it is possible to detach the magic eye tube, without interfering with the rest of the radio, it seems to be appropriate to put a connector for that. Some spade connectors are used in this case. This radio has a quite sophisticated dial cord system, which includes the tuning, the tone, and band selection. The documentation coming from the model PZ69 is good, but here are the steps for rebuilding it, shown in a more gradual way. First of all it is necessary to consider what will be called dial shuttle, which is a detached element with two pulleys, that has to travel horizontally. This component has two hooks where the first two line cords should be attached. Before going any further, it must be verified that the variable capacitor can be completely turned and that the shuttle travels accordingly, from end to end. Secondly there is the dial indicator cord, that travels through the shuttle pulleys. The dial indicator would be attached on top of this cord, between the two pulleys. Finally there are the tone and band indicator cords, controlled by the respective knobs. For the radio under restoration, nylon fishing line, 0.5 mm diameter, has been used. Testing the radio in its cabinet, after some hours of satisfactory radio play, Nothing could be heard anymore, right after some significant noise from the loudspeaker. It was the final amplifier tube. Testing the tube it appeared that, even though there were no apparent shorts and no signs of gas poisoning, the heater was drawing too much current, without becoming red. The tube was clearly worn out, but the behavior of the heater was unusual. All the remaining original tubes are replaced with new ones, especially the magic eye. With all the new tubes on the chassis, the radio is tested on its eight bands, starting from the medium wave. The strange helicopter noise that can be heard in the broadcast band, comes from interference produced elsewhere in the same building. Sí, a
passato per il sistema. Dolayısıyla bu yüzde on üç virgül altı olarak belirlendi. Hmm. So on another front, 
This radio project is fully documented and available from these links, also appearing in the enclosed description, under the Show More tab. Thank you. 